Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashad. We have a very special episode today. What you see in front of me are three models of the North American X-15. We had done a part one early years of the X-15 program, and I'll put a link to that video in the title block and, and at the end of this video as well. But uh, just to review really quickly, the North American X-15 was the follow-on to the Mach 3 Bell X-2 and what is considered the first generation of X-planes at Edwards Air Force Base in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The X-15 represented a quantum leap ahead in terms of instrumentation, the speeds it could achieve, uh, the altitudes it could achieve, and what it represented for manned spaceflight. It was that step from the rocket-powered airplanes that could reach maybe 100,000 feet and the Mercury program, which uh, took man into orbit and suborbital flights in the early 1960s. The X-15 was launched from a B-52, as we mentioned, and uh, flown by a single pilot to altitudes as high as 354,000 feet and speeds as fast as Mach 6.7. In the early phase, we saw that uh, much of the effort was devoted to getting the airplane operational, just getting it to be able to fly. For every uh, flight that was launched from the B-52, there were, at, in the early days, at least two or three, maybe sometimes five or six aborts, including some that happened just before the launch when some system would go offline or a weather problem. But uh, I just want to make the point that the early pioneering years of the X-15 were quite different than what's going to be explained in this video, where after 1965, they had really amazing uh, scientific experiments that were flown on the airplane, and uh, it achieved the, the peak of its performance in terms of speed and uh, the operational capabilities for an experimental research airplane. What you see here are three models. One is a Topping, which was the manufacturer that built all the uh, aerospace models for promotion, and you'd see them in the offices, you'd see them in movies. Uh, this is by far one of the most pristine examples that I've ever uh, experienced. And you notice that it's on a stand. The stand says North American X-15. And I want to make a, a mention that the, uh, there were two stands built by Topping for the X-15. This is one of those little model minutia moments that uh, is kind of fun to share. What you see here is the speed record stand. Uh, the angle is about maybe 18, 20 degrees, but they made an altitude record stand where the model was more at a 60 degree angle. And those were given to the pilots or to people uh, associated with the programs. And it's interesting to note that uh, I did uh, see a collection where both those models were displayed in a cabinet side by side, and you could see how dramatic those different angles were. This airplane represents ship one, tail number 66670. Let me take a moment to explain that the first digit of a serial number on the tail of an Air Force airplane, military airplane <clears throat> is the year of the contract. So here what we're looking at is 56, 1956, airplane 6670. The X-15s were numbered in sequence. So ship two, 66671, and ship three would be 66672. Ship three was lost in an accident. We'll talk about it in a moment. Ship one is in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C. And the X-15A2, or ship two, was at the uh, National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, in its original configuration. When this airplane set the world record of Mach 6.7 on October 3rd, 1967, it was covered with a white coating. We'll talk in a little more detail about that in a moment. But I just want to make the distinction that the uh, airplane was originally flown in its black Inconel X matte finish with the external tanks and then added the ablative coating right before the speed record flight in 1967. Now that we've looked at an overview of the X-15 program, let's take a look at each airplane in a little more detail. And stay tuned toward the end because we've got a model that you will not believe. So here we have a beautiful topping model of X-15 Ship 1. And uh, you notice the uh, beautiful shape I've had comments on the channel about why the vertical stabilizers were triangular in plan form. Most aerodynamic shapes, wings, airfoils, have curves to them. In this case, the straight line triangular plan form for the vertical stabilizers, upper and lower, were for effective aerodynamic control at hypersonic speed. Again, hypersonic is speed above Mach 5. So it was used at that time 
Uh, later flights were actually flown without the lower ventral, as you see here, and uh, it was proven that the airplane would fly as well, if not better, without the lower ventral for certain speed ranges. The X-15 first flew in September of 1959, and uh, the first test pilot to fly the airplane was North American's Scott Crossfield. He served as chief engineer, chief program pilot, uh, and literally pioneered this airplane. He left NACA, having flown the Douglas Skyrocket to Mach 2, and literally devoted his career and his life to the development of the X-15. The first Air Force pilot to fly was uh, Major Robert White, first NASA pilot Joe Walker. Those three men uh, put the X-15 into the record books initially in 1960-61. Uh, this was the, the real pioneer of the three airplanes. Uh, I should mention that the third airplane had a slightly different control system. We'll talk about that. But uh, the beauty of the X-15 is that uh, it was flown as an airplane in the atmosphere, and then it had ballistic controls, wingtip and nose jets that would steer the airplane and align it when it was in ballistic flight outside the Earth's atmosphere. So a, a significant airplane, a very pioneering airplane, and again, ship one, hangs in the National Air and Space Museum at Washington, D.C. Here's an X-15 model that was made in the North American model shop in Inglewood, California. This is the second airplane and a modification of its original design. Ship 2 was flown by NASA pilot Jack McKay in November of 1962 and encountered uh, engine problems, had to make an emergency landing. He couldn't jettison all his propellants and he landed uh, very fast. The flaps did not uh, deploy all the way as well. And the airplane uh, crashed onto Mud Lake when the left main skid collapsed and the airplane actually overturned. Uh, McKay survived the accident, but he was severely injured. Uh, he did fly the X-15 later on after recovering. But it was a significant moment in the program. And uh, as with so much in aerospace, it was one step back and five steps forward. From the damaged uh, second X-15, the A-2 model was built, and that's what you see here. Uh, this was an airplane that had two external tanks. The fuselage was lengthened, and this gave the extra uh, burn time to the XLR-99 rocket engine. This was very significant because that allowed the airplane to go faster, and there were other problems inherent in doing that, which we'll talk about in a moment. But here you can see on this beautiful model the stand, the nameplate, and uh, the basic configuration of the X-15A2. One of the key features of the X-15A2 was the design of its windshield. These windshield panes were oval in shape because on the first airplane uh, it had experienced cracking of the plexiglass uh, at high speeds and high temperatures and to avoid that they made an oval windshield pane. However, in the high-speed flights of the A2 there were tremendous uh, spikes in temperature around the airframe. And to avoid any damage to the Inconel X uh, fuselage structure, they coated the airplane with an ablative coating that was pink in color, the texture of a pencil eraser, uh, and then covered with a white protective coating so that the airplane appeared as you see in this photograph. Well, that was fine, except that the coating melted at high temperatures. And so the pilot of the A-2 would fly the launch and climb phase of the flight looking out the right side of the cockpit and an, what they called an eyelid or a two-piece cover for the left side was in place. As the ablative coating melted over the right side, the pilot would be on instruments over the top of the ballistic arc coming back into reentry and for landing he would open the eyelid and literally land the airplane looking out the left side of the cockpit. On October 3rd, 1967, Air Force pilot Lieutenant Colonel Pete Knight flew the A-2 to a world record speed that still stands to this day. Knight achieved a speed of Mach 6.7 at a peak altitude of 103,000 feet. The airplane was charred and burned on uh, re-entry and it never flew again. Here's a photo of what the airplane looked like. The dummy scramjet engine that had been attached to the lower ventral actually burned off. 
and 3,000 degree air scorching its way into the engine compartment nearly brought the flight to a disastrous end. But Knight was able to get it on the ground before that happened. After its epic flight in October of 1967, the A2 was restored by North American to its original black finish with the external tanks. And this is the airplane that you can see today at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Sadly, the third X-15 was lost in an accident in November of 1967. Test pilot Major Michael Adams got into a situation. There was a, an electrical spike in the control system right at launch, and that set up a sequence of events. Uh, sadly, he was uh, uh, lost in a, a, a spin at Mach 5, and the airplane exceeded its uh, load limits and uh, uh, disintegrated, and sadly, uh, uh, Mike Adams was lost in that accident. Uh, he is included posthumously in the list of uh, astronauts that won their wings in the airplane for flying at altitudes in excess of 260,000 feet. Uh, but it, is the, it was the only loss of an airplane, the only fatality in the X-15 program, which made 199 flights from September of 1959 to October of 1968. One thing to note about the advanced X-15 flights toward the end of the program is that nearly 40 separate experiments were flown. The airplane carried 1,300 pounds of research instrumentation, most of which was located in a special bay just aft of the cockpit. Other experimental equipment was carried in wingtip pods and the tail cone box, a housing on the upper aft fuselage above the exhaust that provided a platform for experiments requiring a clear view of the sky at peak altitudes other experiments included biomedical and physiological instrumentation to record the effects of high acceleration and weightlessness on the pilot. The last of the three X-15s built, ship 66672, was a unique airplane. It had the MH-96 adaptive flight control system. And what you see here is a North American model of a modified ship 3 with a delta wing and tip plates. This is an airplane that was expected to go to Mach 8. It was never built, but it was studied in terms of the effect of a delta wing on the X-15 plan form. The tip plates were shaped differently and could be mounted in different positions depending on the types of flights and experiments being conducted. And then you notice also on the bottom a dummy scramjet engine, scramjet standing for supersonic combustion ramjet, a higher performance. Think of, think of a ramjet with afterburner in a sense. Uh, that would uh, boost the airplane to speeds above uh, its Mach 6.7 ultimate uh, flight. It's an extended fuselage. It's got the oval uh, windshield. Uh, it's a unique airplane. Uh, you notice also that it's got what they call the aft fuselage box containing experiments for scanning stars, missile exhaust plumes, and other types of classified uh, experiments, as well as a rocket nozzle booster an extender of the rocket nozzle to add increased thrust. It's a beautiful model, again from North American. You can see the logo on the stand. Although studies for the Delta Wing and tip plate equipped uh, X-15A3 were conducted and were significant, the airplane never flew in this Delta Wing configuration. I promised you a surprise at the end of this presentation, and here it is. a special configuration, a model from Marquardt Propulsion Systems, the X-15 Supercharged Ejector Ramjet. What is that? In the late 1970s, it was envisioned that all aircraft would be required to fly at Mach 4. This included photo recon, strategic bombers, point defense interceptors, and attack airplanes as well. To test a propulsion system that could do that, it was envisioned that the X-15 would carry uh, the supercharged ejector ramjet, which you see on the underside of the airplane, like so. The supercharged ejector ramjet was a system that used a large number of small rocket engines to pump the ramjet motor. A ramjet functions as you see in this chart. It only operates at very high speed, generally in uh, excess of Mach 3. Compressed air is taken into the front of the engine. It is then uh, injected with fuel, which ignites and produces thrust. 
In order to flight test this power plant at its design airspeeds, a highly modified X-15 was proposed, with a lower fuselage mounted SERJ engine replacing the standard XLR-99. The structural changes required would have been the modification to the ventral fin, revised main landing gear, and altered propellant tanks. So there you have it, a look at the later phase of the X-15 program and how this amazing airplane contributed to uh, the data and knowledge in aerospace that propelled man into uh, the realms of the space shuttle and beyond. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We enjoy bringing these presentations to you and we thank you so much for your support. Until next time, take care. I'd like to thank the wonderful people who helped make this presentation possible.